Howdy folks, and today's lore episode is on the TIE Fighter. Like the arrowhead shape of a Star Destroyer and the white armor of Stormtroopers, the distinctive profile of the twin iron engine TIE Starfighter was a familiar symbol of the Empire's military might. No Imperial facility, be it the smallest base or the largest battle station, was without its force of TIEs, and these single seat fighters embodied the Empire's ethics in their form as well as function. This distinctive ship was instantly recognizable as its small sensor silhouette when viewed from the front or rear made it <laughs> made it a tricky target for enemies. Like the majority of Imperial Starfleet vessels, the TIE Fighter was produced by CNR Flight Systems, a corporation created by the notorious designer Wraith CNR. The most common model, designated TIE LN, was known as a Space Superiority Fighter. With the exception of its sensor pallets, which were manufactured by Fabritech, every other part of this TIE Fighter was built from CNR components. Unlike Rebel Fighters such as the X-Wing or Y-Wing craft, the cheaply produced TIE Fighter had a relatively small mass and was notorious for its lack of what many would consider key starship systems. TIE Fighters had no defensive deflector shield capability, no hyperdrive engines or compatibility with astromech droids, and no cockpit life support system for the pilot. Life support was handled not by ship systems but by the black atmosphere suits worn by the TIE Fighter pilots. The lack of any shields reduced the mass of the craft to make it faster and more maneuverable. Rebel Alliance pilots mockingly nicknamed TIE Fighters Eyeballs due to the shape of the spherical cockpit module. In fact, many noted Rebel flyers, including ranking pilots like Han Solo and Tycho Kelchu, had originally trained in Imperial ac Academies where they were taught to fly the TIE Fighter and its earlier models. The lack of a hyperdrive was addressed through the way that the Empire deployed its TIE Fighters. They were typically based at a static facility where they acted as sentry ships or formed part of the forces on board a Star Destroyer, which transported the ships to their battles and recovered them after combat. A single TIE Fighter squadron numbered 12 ships, but the typical com complement aboard a Star, Star Destroyer was 72, a full attacks attack wing of 6 squadrons. There were several TIE Fighter variants that were created by fitting out the standard fuselage with special equipment. These included the TIE Scout, the TIE slash FC fire control forward observer and the TIE RC model. The latter, built for reconnaissance and surveillance missions, replaced the standard fighter's laser cannons with an array of, an array of advanced sensor gear. The basic TIE fighter also had an extended family of related designs, which included the TIE interceptor, TIE bomber, TIE advanced X1 and several others. Aside from the Rebel Alliance's powerful A-wing fighter, the TIE fighter was the fastest sublight combat, combat vessel in service during the Empire's reign. Imperial TIE Fighter pilots had a high rate of attrition, as the location of the fuel tank inside the fighter's cockpit pod often meant that a lucky hit would completely destroy the ship before the pilot could eject. Now, these pilots that could defy the odds, however, could fly this nimble craft to the extremes of its capabilities, outmaneuvering bulkier ships such as the X-Wing with devastating results. The TIE Fighter was best suited for combat operations in the airless void of space. Its less than aerodynamic form could make it tough to fly within a planetary atmosphere as some pilots discovered to their costs. The limited fuel capacity of TIE Fighters meant that flight endurance was quite low. In an extended combat scenario, a TIE Fighter might have been forced to refuel more than once. Pilots would typically dock with a carrier vessel or base before launching, once more on a fresh ship already in a hangar cradle. Unlike their rebel counterparts, Imperial pilots had no attachment to their individual craft and the production line nature of TIE Fighters meant that one was typically the same as another. Fabricated from a titanium alloy, the command module and hull of a TIE Fighter was resilient and light. A modular design, the cockpit sphere used in the TIE LN model could also be reconfigured for a TIE interceptor. The cockpit sported a large transparent steel viewport for maximum visibility, giving the module a distinctive shape and access to the cockpit was via a hatch mounted on the upper surface. And join energy from the TIE Fighter's hexagonal solar panel arrays, a pair of CNR Fleet System's PW-401 iron manoeuvring jets used a volatile mix of gaseous radioactive fuel and charged iron particles to produce forward thrust for the ship. Together with the main ionization reactor, these jets formed the complete CNR Fleet System's PS-4 twin iron engine system that gave the ship its tire designation. And the TIE Fighter's prominent solar collection panels were made of armoured quadanium steel, enclosing a complex network of energy accumulator lines and a heat exchange matrix. 
This mechanism fed power to a ring of energy collection coils which linked to the twin iron engines via a high power solar ionization reactor. Now, when we move on and actually look at the TIE Fighter battle tactics, Imperial TIE Fighters were officially designated for a limited range of, vis of mission parameters, but in practice they were used across the spectrum of space and planetary combat. Their primary missions were to attack rebel and pirate vessels and to protect space stations, convoys and planetary garrisons. Secondary missions included escorting TIE bombers on planetary assaults. Now, much of the time that a TIE pilot spent in the cockpit was devoted to patrol duty. Deployed in sections that usually consisted of between three and six TIE fighters, patrols would scale the space surrounding a base, space station or, co or convoy for unauthorized vehicles. If such a vehicle was found, the patrol might engage, a engage in a maneuver known as the Atom, Atom officially named a force multiple orbit. The Atom involved the tires adopting a series of fast orbits around a larger vessel. The effect was to create a dizzying swirl of motion that would prevent the pilots of the captured craft, craft from trying to escape. And it was during this maneuver, the tires looked like electrons speeding around the nucleus in an Atom, hence the name. In some cases, the TIE Patrol might wish to disable the craft, and they would therefore go about shearing off its thruster modules with glancing laser shots. And the vessel would be unable to escape, but would be left intact for the processing and interrogation of prisoners. As the Galactic Civil War continued, some Imperial commanders began to grow tired of the disregard in which TIE Fighter pilots' lives were held. Baron Sun Tia Fell, commander of the 181st Fighter Group, began to give his pilots further training to supplement their academy-based knowledge. He encouraged them to think for themselves while still acting as a group. These methods proved highly successful and the Baron's fighters were responsible for some famous Imperial victories. Examples such as the 181st led to a shift in Imperial tactical thinking overall. A number of improvements were made to the TIE, which eventually resulted in the introduction of the TIE Advanced, the TIE Interceptor, and the TIE Defender. These improved vessels made an immediate difference to pilot survival rates. As a result, Imperial tactics began to shift from basic assaults founded on superiority in numbers to more effective and individual-based maneuvers. This, the changes were beginning to bear fruit by the time of the Battle of Endor, but by then it was already too late. The Empire had squandered pilots and starfighters with ill-thought-out tactics and was left with insufficient forces to recover fully from the disaster at Endor. And that is the TIE Fighter along with some of its battle tactics. So if you like the video, video, be sure to drop a like or subscribe if you're new to keep up to date with my videos. Leave a comment or two as well if you want to let me know what you thought of the video and I'll talk to you all in the next one. Later.